Hello, statisticians. Mr. Young Saver here from Skew the Script. Today, we're going to analyze who was the GOAT in basketball, the greatest of all time in terms of scoring in the NBA. To answer that question, we're going to use the tools of percentiles, cumulative frequency, and Z scores. Let's skew it. Today's lesson is on percentiles and z-scores. This is lesson 2.1 in our course sequence. Today we're gonna look at these three athletes, Will Chamberlain, Michael Jordan, and LeBron James. And we're gonna ask, who was the GOAT, the greatest of all time in terms of scoring in basketball? If you'd like to follow along using our guided notes, you can print them up at this URL. So the first topic we're gonna to talk about today is percentiles. We're gonna use a lot of these skills when we talk about the basketball example, but first let's talk about something a little bit more simple. SAT scores. Here's me, Mr. Young Saver, as a high school student. And here is the great Guy Fieri, my favorite celebrity in the world. He's a chef and he's the mayor of Flavor Time. I've seen his show, Diners, Drive and Dives. Um, let's say that on my SAT in high school, I got a score of 1,050 out of 1,600. And say that in Guy Fieri's hometown, they don't offer SAT. They don't offer that in Flavortown, USA. Instead, they offer the ACT, a different standardized test. And on the ACT, Guy Fieri got 23 points out of a total of 36. So we're both applying for admission into Flavortown College. And the question is, who should they select, the college? Me with an SAT score of 1,050 or Guy Fieri with an ACT score of 23. Now, one simple analysis we could do is just divide the number of points we earned out of the total. I got 1050 out of 1600 possible points or 66%. And Guy Fieri got 23 out of 36, that's 64%. So maybe I'm the better one to admit, but unfortunately it's not that simple. These tests use very different scoring scales and different scoring systems. So this is not really a fair comparison. We can't just divide the numbers out of the total. So how can we compare these performances? That's how we're going to use percentiles. Percentiles are the percent of data that are less than or equal to a certain data value. And note, this definition is sometimes just less than outside of the context of AP stats. Some statisticians say percentile is just the percent of data less than, not less than or equal to, but in AP stats, it's always less than or equal to. So let's look at a simple example first. Here's an old data set we looked at of 12 salaries at a company in terms of thousands of dollars. At what percentile is the person in this, in this company who makes a salary of $43,000? Well, do we look at the percent of data that is less than or equal to that salary of 43,000? There are 10 salaries at or below $43,000, including that individual. So that means 10 out of these 12 total salaries were at or below 43,000 or 83% of the salaries, 83% of our data. So the salary of 43,000 is at the 83rd percentile salary. Note that uses the word at, that's often kind of confusing. The salary of 43,000 is at the 83rd percentile of salaries. Now let's look at uh, percentiles and box plots for large data sets. Uh, quartile one is usually gonna be at about the 25th percentile. Quartile two or the median is at about the 50th percentile and quartile three is at the 75th percentile. This makes sense. Quartiles, you're thinking quarters, the first quarter, second quarter, third quarter. Now let's get back to this initial question. Who should Flavortown College select? Well, another way we could ask this is what percent of people did each test taker, me and Guy Fieri, outscore? Well, here are the percentiles given for the SAT and the ACT. And if you look at my score, 1050, I'm at the 45th percentile and Guy Fieri at the score of 23 in the ACT is at the 69th percentile. So that means that I tied or outscored 45% of SAT test takers. Guy Fieri, on the other hand, tied or outscored 69% of test takers. So who should Flavortown College select? Well, with a higher percentile outscoring more or higher proportion of test takers, we have Guy Fieri. He has the more impressive score. And of course, he is the mayor of Flavortown. He's the one that <laughs> the college should select. Um, I can never beat Guy Fieri in any context, really. Now, here's uh, another topic we're going to discuss before we get to our main topic of Z-scores and the NBA, cumulative relative frequencies. So uh, on the AP exam, as well as uh, out there looking at statistics in the world, you might come across cumulative relative frequency charts. It's a very intimidating and long name. It's very scary, but just think of it like this. Cumulative relative frequency is the same thing as percentile. These are just percentile charts. So you can take that y-axis on these charts and instead of cumulative relative frequency, just turn it into percentile. And here's a percentile chart of ACT scores. 
So is 18 a good ACT score? That's a question we might ask. Well, let's look at our percentile chart of ACT scores. Here's 18, the ACT score of 18. We're going to draw it up and then see what Y value that corresponds to. That corresponds to 40th percentile, 40th cumulative relative frequency, 40th percentile. So that means that ACT score of 18 is at or above 40% of ACT test takers. So it's an, it's an okay score. Now, uh, to be in the top quartile, you want to be in the top quartile of SAT, uh, ACT takers. Um, what score would you need on your exam? So we're going to go from the percentile, uh, 75th percentile, it's the top quartile, Q3. And we're going to draw a line over, and then we're going to go down and see what ACT score that corresponds with. We see that's a score of 24. So you need a score of 24 or higher to be in the top quartile of ACT test takers. Note that 24 is also going to be Q3, top 75%. <clears throat> Now, uh, let's look at the standardized scores or the Z-scores. So Z-scores measure how many standard deviations a data point is above or below a mean. And here is the fancy formulas for Z-scores. You just take the data point, subtract the mean, and divide by the standard deviation. What does it actually mean? Let's look at an example. We're going to go back to our key analysis today. Who was the best scorer? Wilt Chamberlain, who played in the 1960s NBA, Michael Jordan, who played in the 1990s NBA, and LeBron James, who played in the 2010s NBA. We're not going to talk about other facets. We're just talking about their scoring. Now, if you look at the points per game they average over their career, Michael Jordan and Wilt Chamberlain both had 30.1 points per game over the course of their career. And as of the latest data, LeBron had 27.1. So if we just look at that, we see that Wilt and Jordan are kind of tied in our power rankings for who was the best scorer. But we can also ask a more subtle question, which is who was the best relative to their time? Who was the best relative to the league around them? And we can look at the average points per game among players in each of their eras. So in the 1960s NBA, the average number of points per game for each player was about 10.8. In the 1990s, it was about 8.7 points per game for each player. And then in LeBron's era in the 2010s, where he was really at his peak, which was to the 2010s, 8.4 points per game. Um, so if we get those differences where we take their career points per game average and subtract off the mean points per game among players in their era, we see how much better they were in terms of raw points per game compared to the average. And we can see here that Jordan actually had the higher difference between him and the average folks of his era. Uh, Wilt was number two and LeBron was number three. So here are updated power rankings. But there's one last thing that we need to consider. What about variability? Here I've visualized the distribution of points per game in two leagues. League A has low variability in how much players score per game, and League B has high variability. So we can see here that the standard deviation of points per game among players is only two in League A. It's four in League B. There's more spread between players in League B in terms of how much points they score per game. They have the same average though. The average point scored per game is about 10 in both leagues. Let's look at a player. And this, if you zoom in, is me. And it might not look like it from that picture. Um, and it might not be true, actually. But I'm pretty good at basketball. Uh, let's say that I score 14 points per game on average and I play in these leagues. Um, so I'm going to graph my points per game for higher than the mean of 10. That's 14 points per game in both leagues. But I kind of stack up differently in leagues based on the variability, even though I have the same distance between my points per game and the mean, I stack up differently. In league A, I'm two sigma, two standard deviations above the mean. In league B, I'm only one standard deviation above the mean. Remember the standard deviation in league B is higher. So in league A, there are only a few players, we can see in that data, there's only a few players that are better than me versus in league B where there's high variability, higher spread, there's probably a fair amount of players who are gonna be better than me. So we need to standardize my value of points per game. Standardization is a points location distribution depends on both the distance from the center and the distribution spread. We need to consider both distance from the mean and the standard deviation. So let's standardize these values we got before. We already found the differences from the mean. Let's get the standard deviation of points per game in their eras. Here are the standard deviations in the 60s, 90s, and 2010s. 
and let's get the z-score which is the number of standard deviations away from the mean. So what we can do is we can take the difference, how much better they were in the points per game, and then divide it by the standard deviation to get it in terms of the units of standard deviation. So we see here, we get these different values um, and we've done the z-score format. We took each data point, their points per game, subtracted the mean, and then divided by the standard deviation. And we can see here that Michael is number one. Michael Jordan's, points per game was 3.6 standard deviations above the mean for his era, making him the most unusually high scorer among these three. It means that he was more unusually above the mean compared to the other scores. So we can see that at this moment, we will say he is the, the greatest of all time because when we standardize their values, he was the most unusually high outlier among the three. Now, what about a not so great player? This is Adam Morrison, pictured with the Lakers, which he spent a couple of years with in their season. In 2009, in 2009 season, he played 44 minutes total. To put that in perspective, the two best players on the team that year in the Lakers were Kobe Bryant and Pau Gasol. They played almost 3,000 minutes each. Now, some people say that I look kind of like Pau Gasol. That's for another time. One thing to know about Adam Morrison before we get into his playing is a great feature of his. Let me zoom in here this beard, the amazing uh, <laughs> a sight of the NBA. Um, it's something I always looked at when I was a kid watching Lakers growing up. Now, while with Lakers, he averaged 2.2 points per game. The league average was 8.4 and the standard deviation was 5.5. So let's take his data value, 12.2, subtract the mean, divide by standard deviation to get his Z-score. If we do that, we plug in the values and we get a value of negative 1.1. What this means is that Adam Morrison's scoring rate was 1.1 standard deviations below the league average in his era. That negative means that he was below the league average. So if we compare him with LeBron, who uh, also played in the 2010s era, we can see that there's a negative and a positive score. When you see a positive Z-score, that means the data value is above the mean, in case of LeBron. And if you see a negative score, it means the data value is below the mean. So that's what to keep in mind with the direction of your Z-scores. Now, one thing to consider here, uh, you know, the NBA, you, you can score a lot of points, but at the end of the day, it's all about the bling. Um, in, in 2009, this team with Laker, the Lakers, Pau Gasol and Kobe Bryant, they won a championship. And then they also won back to back. They won in 2010 as well. Adam Morrison played on both those teams, mostly on the bench, but he was with the team. So he has two rings, two championships as well. That means that Adam Morrison, with his 2.2 points per game and most of the time on the bench, has more championship rings than Allen Iverson, who averaged almost 27 points per game, Russell Westbrook, who's averaged more than 23 points per game, Steve Nash, who averaged about 14 points per game and is a great passer, uh, James Harden, Patrick Ewing, Chris Paul, Charles Barkley, Carl Malone, and Jerry West, who the outline of whose body is literally the logo of the NBA. He has more, Adam Morrison has more championship rings than all these guys combined. So maybe he's the go. I don't know. Anyway, let's get into our discussion for today. Now we know that Jordan sco scored the most relatively. He was the most unusually high scorer compared to his era. Now, one question we might have is, is it because he actually shot the most? If you look at the shots per game that these guys took in their careers, we see that Jordan had the most shots per game on average at almost 23. He also had the lowest percent of shots made. Of all the shots they took, uh, Jordan had the lowest percent made. So given these new statistics, is Jordan, in your mind, still the greatest of all time at scoring? What other stats also may be helpful in determining who was best? This is something you're to discuss in class. That's it for today's statisticians. We'll see you next time on Skew the Script.